um, get one of y'all to answer each question, and then I might have some comments about it. So, um, what's and, and when you give your answer, uh, give your answer, and also where on the label you found the information, so that we can all follow. Okay, so who found the common name of the product? All right, yeah, in the back. Emma Jack. Yeah, and, and I, I tried really hard to make that legible, um, so good job. What, and where did you find that? It's on the front, and then also um, under quick facts. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So uh, I, I think, and, and it's probably subject to debate, but I think the correct way to pronounce it, if anybody cares, which you probably don't, is imidacloprid. Imidacloprid. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. <laughs> this is what I do at night, is I practice pronunciation of, of active ingredients. Uh, but you will always find the active ingredient on the front of the product. And not only the active ingredient, you'll also find the percentage of the active ingredient in the product. So, like, for example, if you're buying um, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in kind of the original Roundup, but is now a generic, you know, you can find it in a bunch of generic products. You know, you can find it 41%, you can find it 18%, you can find it 4%. So that might play into, um, uh, you know, the uh, cost, you know, the 4% the bottle might be cheaper but cost per you know, gallon of spray solution is going to be a lot cheaper if you get the higher percentage. Um, and, all right, has anybody ever heard of this product, this, this, uh, this particular chemical before, metacloprid? Any Sierra Club members? <laughs> I mean, the, the Sierra Club has got it out for this, for this chemical. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I think the Sierra Club does good work. Um, but, um, and, and there's reasons, and, and I, you know, I intentionally chose this product because it's a challenging product. The metacloprid is the one that has been accused with some justification, but uh, in many cases overblown and exaggerated, uh, of being harmful to pollinators, okay? Um, so it's kind of been targeted as, this is why all the bees are dying. Well, okay. But, all right, so we'll get back to that. What's the signal word? Call, call, okay, everybody found that. And, and who, who remembers what the three are in the order of increasing toxicity that I just told you five minutes ago? Caution, warning, and danger. Caution, warning, and danger. Probably 90% of what you'll see on the shelf at, uh, you know, Garden Center, Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart is going to be caution. You know, you may occasionally see a warning. You might see a danger, but I think that's going to be pretty rare. And certainly, if you have a choice between two products, one of them has a caution, one of them has a warning, go with the caution. Um, so that, that's a good uh, way to shop. Can I use this to control white flies on tomatoes? No. no. Okay. Uh, and with the turquoise mask, why not? Um, because it should not be sprayed on the Absolutely. And where did you find that information? Quick folks. Yeah. Where, where do you use? Yeah. yeah. And that's one thing that's changed, and I had to change this question because the previous formulation of this product said that you could use it on non bearing fruit trees. You know, like fruit trees that had not started to produce yet. So, you know, you plant a fruit tree and it might be three or seven years before you start product, you know, start getting a harvest off of it. But, but they've, they've changed that. You know, it's just, you can't use it in that situation. Um, it will control white flies, but you can't use it on food crops. Okay. Um, how much should I apply to 
protect an ash tree from the emerald ash borer circumference is 12 inches. Six ounces. Six ounces. Okay, somebody tell me, raise your hand, tell me how you figure that. Yep. Um, on the, the same thing with the pickbacks, all they would last in one change. That's how much you buy. Yep. A half ounce per inch. Um, and that was circumference was 12 inches, so half of that. Yep. Perfect. And um, so that goes into uh, the, the application rate. What is the application rate of the product? Again, it's based on science. So if you use the recommended application rate, and in this case, it's you know, based on circumference of the trunk. Um, in, in other cases, it might be ounces per 100 square foot. It might be um, spray to the point that the, the spray just starts dripping off the foliage. It might be, if it's a granular product, it might be pounds or ounces per hundred, it's not gonna be pounds, but it might be ounces per hundred square foot. Whatever that rate is, it's based on the, the research that took place. And if that rate didn't work, then more is not gonna work. <laughs> okay? All right? So use the recommended rate. If, if the recommended rate doesn't work, it means either you chose the wrong product, you applied it wrong, you applied it at the wrong time, you know, there was some other reason that it didn't work, okay? But more is, is not gonna work. Well, it, it might, but if you, if you use more than the recommended rate, you're also potentially veering off into where you're into, you know, side effects, that, you know, environmental impacts and stuff like that. So, all right, um, true or false? I should wear chemical resistant gloves when using this product. Okay, lots of people said true. Why, raise your hand and tell me why you said true. Yes, sir. The precautionary statements on the back page said it would not have the skin. Yeah. Okay, so this is interesting, actually. Um, did anybody put false? Why did you put false, sir? Exactly. Okay. All right, so. If, glove, so if gloves are not specifically recommended, then the science says you're okay not wearing them, all right? You still need to be careful, but the way I worded the question is, should you, <laughs> right? I probably would, you know? Um, I probably would, but technically, you know, the science says you're okay and, 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 the, and part of that goes into the application method also because the way you apply this is you, I'm sure you saw, you pour a little bit into a, um, a watering can and then sprinkle it around the tree. And you can, if, you're, if you're reasonably careful, you should be able to do that without getting any on your hands. You know? So, yes? That's a great question, and, and I, I, I'm not sure I know enough about physiology to be certain. Maybe Ashley could fill in or somebody else, but um, the goal, you know, this is not irrigation. This is about getting uptake into the plant because the way this product works is you apply to the, to the ground, and then the solution is absorbed by the root system and taken up into the trunk and distributed throughout the plant. And I guess they found that you get better uptake into the rest of the plant by applying it close to the trunk. That, that's got almost has to be it. So that's a great question. Yeah, if you're irrigating 
yeah, you want to try to cover the root zone, and you certainly want to protect the root zone from any damage. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes? I would just assume also you have a better chance of getting it to the correct plant. Oh. If you apply it directly to the plant, then you have a better chance of not broadcasting it incorrectly to nearby other plants if you went to the dirt line. That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, all right, is, and I didn't cover these terms, but is, I'm sure you could figure out, is this a ready to use or a concentrate? <laughs> concentrate, okay, well, how did you figure that out? Somebody raise your hand and tell me how you figured that out. <laughs> okay. All right, it's a no-brainer. All right, uh, so my recommendation is where you have, and you don't always, but where you have a choice, between a ready to use, and, and when I say a ready to use, it, you know, a, a, a weed uh, control product or an insecticide that comes in something where you, there's no mixing. You could, it's got its own little trigger spray, or you know, sometimes it'll have a little bower, battery powered pump that comes with the product. That's an advantage to you because it eliminates the mixing step. So you don't have to worry about um, uh, miscalculating ounces per gallon or getting, you know, mismeasuring. It, it just eliminates that. And also, uh, it eliminates you having to handle the concentrate. So, whatever toxicity that product has, which hopefully is fairly low to start with, but whatever toxicity it has, the toxicity of the concentrate is higher than the toxicity of the diluted spray solution. So if you're buying a ready to use, it's already diluted and it's much lower risk to you as the applicator. So that's, that's why I'm a big fan of those ready to use. All right, what is the, and we've got to have our jargon and our abbreviations and pesticides. So what's, but what's the restricted entry interval? And, and this was tricky because there's not anywhere on this label that says the restricted entry interval is, <laughs> So you had to kind of use some deduction. Did anybody figure that out? Uh, yeah, how about in the very back? No. Right. Who else got it? Or where, where, where'd you find, how'd you find that information? Uh, under directions for use, it says that children pets may re-enter after it's dry. What page is that on? Uh, that's on, I guess, the second page. Right about storage and disposal. I'm sorry, what did you write that? Right about storage and disposal. There's like a little picture of a kid and a dog in my head. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no kids. Yeah, Chip, does, does everybody see that? It's on the, it's like the third page of the label, right hand side, um, and it's a little box. The little icon it says children and pets may re-enter the treated area after it has after it has dried. Um, that's a very short restricted entry interval, and for most homeowner products, it will be short. Again, because you know for the homeowner market, most of the products are you know they they've filtered them out. You know they're not going to sell you the you know some of the the agricultural products might have a restricted entry interval of 24 hours or 48 hours or three days, you know, and, and so the, the farmers actually have to post signs around the field. Um, <clears throat> if you have a lawn service company that treats your lawn, um, that's one piece of information that I would want to know is what's the restricted entry interval of the products you're using and I would want a notification of exactly when, you know, date, time of day, the yard was treated um, so that I could be careful about that. Uh, but again, that gives me confidence that I can use this product. I can put my pets inside and, and keep my children inside, which you won't do that anyway, uh, while you're making the application. But then once it's dried, they can freely go out to the site without, without any risk. So. 
right? Pre-harvest interval. All right, that was a tricky one. Yeah. Uh, you do, not use on food. do not use on food crops. Yeah, so there is no pre-harvest interval. Okay, so this gets back to your question about the strawberries. Okay, so any product, see I, I promised I was gonna come back to it and I did. Mm -hmm. All right, um, any product that's used, that, that is allowed to be used on food products will have a pre-harvest interval. And, uh, and again, it may not necessarily say the pre-harvest interval is, but it will have some verbiage on the label that will say, do not use this product within X number of days of harvest. Okay. So, you know, it may be that in the case of strawberries, you know, you know, the, the products say don't use within two weeks of harvest or a month of harvest. You know, some of the products will have, you know, don't use within a month or 60 days of harvest. I mean, so it really limits your window. Um, some products have a zero day harvest interval which means that you can spray and harvest the same day, okay? Again, it's science, right? So probably a good idea to just rinse off the, the product before you eat it, um, but you can do that. Um, would you classify this product as persistent? And I, I didn't define that from a pesticide standpoint, but it should be pretty obvious. Yes, in the back. I have a question about the previous one. Sure. What would, what would be the reasoning behind spraying and then harvesting? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, for example, with strawberries, the, the harvest season is extended. So, you know, you might, you might pick on one day, but, you know, you might come back and pick again in, in three days and again in three days. And so you, you might need something that's going to continue to protect the crop even during the harvest period. Yeah, that was a great question. All right, so uh, would you classify this product as persistent? Yeah, yes. Yes, it's long lasting. That's great from a pest management standpoint because we get that extended pest control. And so there, there's an advantage to that because we're using less product versus something where we have to go and spray every seven days or something like that. <coughs> But ideally what we like is a product that we spray and it does its job and then it immediately like disappears, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's a trade-off when we, when we have something that's persistent. And one of the trade-offs with this product is that, well, let me, let me I, I, I'll give you a trade-off in just a second. Let's answer the last question. You need to take precautions to protect pollinators and if so, what? You'll be in the job. Do, do it in the in dark. The dark when the pollinators are asleep. Was that was it was it was that on the label? Was that no. specified on the label? No, but that's okay. pollinators are gonna be there when you put it down and they're gonna get into it whether it's dead or not. Okay, that's that's generally a, a good observation, but I'm looking for something specific on the label. Um, it says when the bloom. When it's not in bloom. When it's not in bloom. So you don't want to be, and where, where is that listed? The very back. The very back. Environmental hazard to the bottom. Environmental hazard. Mm -hmm. And it's the last bullet point under environmental hazard. Product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming plants or weeds. Do not apply product to blooming plants or weeds if bees are foraging in the treatment area. Um, so yes, your strategy of applying, you know, right after dusk, hopefully you can still see enough to make the application, but the, the pollinators have gone back to their, their nests. That might be part of your strategy. Um, They're always foraging in daylight hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if it were me, um, I probably just wouldn't use the product if, like, if, if I was trying to protect an emerald ash borer and there were dandelions and, and clovers and things growing in, in the area that I was going to treat, I would probably remove those first before I made the application. Because it's a systemic product. 
It is. So it's going to get up and thread, even, even if it's not a contact thread, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. And that's the challenging part of this product. And this is a product that um, I would argue has a very limited use case. Um, um, so, you know, if I had an ash tree that I really wanted to protect, I would use it. That may be the only case I would use this product. Um, because, in fact, you know, they talk about for pollinator protection, they talk about don't spray plants that are blooming while uh, pollinators are present. Um, but it, like you said, it is, a, it is systemic, and there has been some research that's, that shows that um, residues can be detected actually in the pollen that gets produced by the plant. So. Yes, question in the back there. Um, yes, it's not really a question, I guess. It's just, um, I don't know, just like a comment. I guess the, the question is, what are the That's why we're doing this. Right. Yeah. This should be a high school class or, right. or, or yeah. a day in the high school. You know, after so you cover. Everybody says this is highly toxic to be. Why is it not on the front? Like, what is it? How the fuck could it be? I know, that's what I just said. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd be in favor of that. Right. But we know yeah. that.
personal protective equipment, PPE if you want to sound really impressive. But, uh, <laughs> personal protective equipment, um, gloves. It, it's just a good habit. Like, like we said with this product, technically you should be okay not wearing gloves. It's probably a good idea. You probably should. Um, so what gloves should you wear? Uh, and, and how should you take care of them? Uh, one thing is when you're making a pesticide application, after you use the gloves, wash them before you take them off. If you have a utility sink, or at least rinse them off real good before you take them off. It's easier to clean them that way. Um, and then um, inspect them before each use, and probably replace them periodically. You know, even if you don't use them that often, uh, the material is going to kind of break down over time, so maybe maybe every year or two, just get in the habit of throwing out the old and, and buying new ones. I mean, you know, what are they? Six or ten bucks a pair, or something like that, for a good pair. You know, for six bucks, you can buy these nice Playtex gloves. Or if you go to Lowe's or to Home Depot for six bucks, you can get super thick plastic gloves with fancy linings. That you couldn't get anything through. They are chemically resistant to just, I've not seen hydrochloric acid doesn't. It takes a long time to get to that product. Hydrochloric acid would eat through that one, heartbeat. Hydrochloric acid would eat through this room in an instant. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Here, let's so let me, let, me talk about, let me talk about shopping for gloves. Um, when you're shopping for gloves, um, it's good to get ones uh, that go ahead and, and cover up to the forearm. That, that's helpful. That's a good strategy. You know, you can purchase the disposable ones, but they just come up to your wrist. So getting the longer gloves is a good idea to protect your forearms. And then also um, getting the unlined gloves. Don't, don't get the ones for your pesticide applications. Don't get the ones that have the you know, soft cotton lining. Because um, if, if that absorbs any product, then you're just re-exposing yourself every time. Um, and and I've, I've often find the heavy-duty gloves in the paint aisle of the hardware yeah. store is one place that you can look. Um, don't use leather gloves. Don't use the ones that have the, and I love these gloves for you know, general yard work, but, but the cloth gloves that are, have the, the palm and the fingers dipped in rubber, because that cloth on the back can absorb spray solution, and then again, you're re-exposing yourself every time. Um, pesticide storage, uh, your homework assignment, and I can, I, I've actually got a little handout that Ashley can email out to everyone if you want to. Your homework assignment is to do an inventory of the pesticide products in your home, okay? And you probably have more than you realize, and you probably have them in multiple locations, all right? And so the, the assignment is, you know, the product, what it's used for, and where it's located. And if you find a lot of stuff that's like under the kitchen sink or, you know, in the kitchen cabinet or, or you know, they need to be high. Uh, lock and key is great, but at least out of the reach of children um, and, you know, fairly secure. Um, ideally, so if I had the choice between the laundry room and an unheated garage, I'd probably put them in the unheated garage just to get them out of the living space just in case there was a leak or something like that. Um, but definitely a way, you know, food preparation areas, no, you probably don't want them in your kitchen. And you never, you always want to keep the product in the original con container, okay? <laughs> People die because you know, hey, neighbor, can I borrow a little bit of that, you know, weed killer and I just pour it into this pop bottle, you know, or this coffee can or whatever. Um, so don't do that. It stays in the original container. Um, if, the, if the original container starts to leak, then put it inside of another container to contain it and then take it to household hazardous waste and just get rid of it. Um, farmers have other options, but for you guys, just, just get rid of it. Um, pesticide disposal. Uh, pesticides, the, the shelf life varies a great deal, but in general, you can count on about three years of, uh, you know, of that product being effective and useful. 
So if you've got products, you know, when you're doing your inventory, that's another thing you, is, is how long have you had that product? If you've got products that are older than three years, put them in a tote and designated spot so your next trip to household hazardous waste, you can take those and get rid of them. Um, and if you've, so idea, so again, the nice thing about these ready to use formulations is there's no mixing and you don't mix up two gallons in your sprayer and then you've got a quart left because you, you miscalculated how much you needed and then you got to figure out what to do with that excess spray solution. And you don't want to just leave it in the sprayer because then you're going to forget what it was. Was it the insect killer for the roses or the weed killer for the lawn? That could be a really bad mistake. <laughs> um, so, um, but you can apply it to a registered site. So if, if you've mixed weed color for your lawn, you didn't quite use it all up, um, maybe there's an area that didn't need to be treated, well, you can still go ahead and, and, and treat it. Um, if you've got unused product, carry it to that household hazardous waste or pesticide disposal day. Um, Ashley said for your pesticide recommendations, you need to make sure you're using one of those fact sheets that are available to you. Um, so I won't go into that. And here are the 10, 11 tips. Oh, it would have been so nice if it was just 10. Uh, but 11 tips for being safe with pesticides. Use as a last resort. Choose the least toxic product. Buy only what you need. You know, it's tempting, okay, if I'm buying a bag of dried cranberries and the, you know, the, the 28 ounce bag is, you know, 15 cents per ounce and the, the smaller bag is 30 cents per ounce, I'm going to buy the big bag, right? Um, but don't do that with pesticides. Buy, because if you buy more than you need, you've got to store it, you've got to store it safely. And then if you don't end up using it, then you've got to dispose of it. And it's not just putting it in the trash. It's remembering when the household hazardous waste disposal is open and where it's located and hours and loading it up and making the special trip. Um, so buy what you need. Ready to use formulations are great um, because you can get what you need for a single application even. It's going to cost you more, but it, it's, it's worth it. Wear your personal protective equipment. If you're using the concentrate, use extra care when you're mixing. Avoid drift. If any of you have a well, it's probably a good idea just to keep a spray-free buffer around your, your well heads. Uh, take note of those restricted entry intervals and those harvest intervals if you're, if you're spraying a food crop. Store slate safely and, and get rid of the excess at your household hazardous waste disposal. And number 12 must be the bees. Yes, absolutely. Pollinator protection. A couple of great resources for extension-based, unbiased, accurate, science-based information. Um, this is the National Pesticide uh, Information Center. This is gold. And you can get, um, if you click on, um, if you click on the pesticide products or the ingredients, you can pull up, you know, a fact sheet in layman's term about that active ingredient and what kind of risks it might pose and, and give you an idea of what precautions to take. So this is a great uh, resource. And um, you, you, again, if you pull up this web, the, if you pull up my presentation, you'll, you'll have the, the address. And this is another good one for diagnosing um, plant problems. Uh, I'd certainly rather, you know, you, you use an NC State resource, but, but Clemson has done a really good job with their plant fact sheets, and they've got a wide, uh, wide coverage of fruits, vegetables, and ornamentals, and you can pull up the fact sheet about tomatoes. It will tell you the common problems with pictures, the control measure, and a link to, to additional information. So this is a really good resource, and you know, I don't, I never go to this site because I'll just type in tomato disease Clemson in, in the search engine and that will take me right to it. Um, so if you want to start at this, you know, if you want to bookmark this, that's fine, but otherwise just do, you know, azalea pests, Clemson.
and you should get there. And this is the address for my presentation. And that is my last slide. Uh, in my remaining less than a minute, <laughs> I'll take any questions.